Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. So I'm excited to be back and I've got a great show for everybody today. The company we're going to focus on for the most part of the show is called Curious Incorporated. And I've been asked to cover this company for quite a while now and I finally saw a nice update in data from their abstract submitted to EHA. I saw a big run-up in the stock that I totally missed out on, so I figured, why not dive into the stock uh, now? So that's going to be our main story for today. And before I jump into that, we're going to talk about two other companies that gave some updates. One is Anovis that has a drug looking at helping in Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. And then we're also going to talk about SIO gene therapies that also shared some updates. So I want to thank everybody for all your support, appreciate all the responses and the engagement. Uh, you can send me an email at matthewlapoire at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter at Matthew Lapoire. So with that, let's just get right into it. And the first company I want to touch on is called Anovis, ticker symbol ANVS. They're trading at a $165 million market cap, and they presented at the Benzinga Global Small Cap Conference. And what it was pitched as originally is that they were going to share some Parkinson's disease biomarker data from their compound and how it affects Parkinson's patients because they showed a bit of efficacy data earlier and this was supposed to be a follow on. But what we ended up seeing is that the CEO only really presented their corporate presentation. They showed the same effect that there was in Parkinson's, which was nice, but we would have liked to see an update in that data sharing some biomarkers that potentially their molecule had. So that was kind of a letdown. The stock sold off on that news, but has since recovered, and I'm recording this on May 17th of 2021, so things might change from now until then. But I'm still holding a position. They are supposed to be releasing some Alzheimer's data in two to three weeks, so I'm going to hold in expectations of a data release coming there. The CEO, Maria, she seems very sweet and seems to know what she's doing, but there is a bit of miscommunication on the timelines. And I think some people are getting frustrated with how that is playing out, and myself included. But I think we need to give her the benefit of the doubt for now until this continues to happen. So all that is to say that I'm going to keep holding, and hopefully in the next two to three weeks we will see an update in Alzheimer's data, which I would expect the stock to increase if it was positive data. The next company I want to touch on is called SIO Gene Therapies. The ticker symbol is SIOX. They are trading at around $125 million market cap, and they were supposed to give a presentation on a number of their programs at this uh, gene therapy conference. They released a press release for their GM1 ganglioside program specifically, and they totally ignored the other presentations that they were giving, which I think is what led to the decrease in the stock because what a lot of the value for SIOX is, is in their Parkinson's disease trial, even though there are multiple hangups with that side of their business right now that a lot of people are expecting some resolution for, myself included. So what they did announce in their press release was that they saw CSF reductions in GM1 ganglioside from clinical trial of AXOAV GM1 gene therapy. And what they showed is that at six months following gene transfer, Serum beta-galactosidase enzyme activity approximately doubled and was restored to between 23 and 57% of the lower limit of the normal reference range in the low-dose cohort. They showed that 18 to 49% reductions from baseline in accumulated substrate GM1 ganglioside were observed in CSF of 4 out of 5 children in the, in the low-dose cohort at 6 months. So this is for their rare disease, GM1 ganglioside, and they're trying to treat it with an AAV vector that would restore the expression of beta-galactosidase that would then lead to a reduction in this, in this molecule, GM1 ganglioside. So what it looks like is that there is efficacy in the four out of five of the children, which is really good to see at six months. Now, the issue, though, is I think that this company, there was an expectation that this company was going to release some update on their Parkinson's disease trial. And we didn't get a press release on this, so I think people assumed that it was just old data that they were presenting again. So we're left in kind of a tough spot again with this company. There's going to be some thin catalysts in the next little while, and the updates are going to be from their other programs besides the Parkinson's disease trial. So what we're going to see is that in the second half of this year, we're going to get an update in 
12-month data from the low-dose cohort of this trial, the GM ganglioside. In Q1 of 2022, we're going to see 12-month update from the high-dose cohort. And then what they've said is that in Q4 of 2021, they're going to be able to certify, or they're hoping to get certification of their new Parkinson's disease gene therapy product. So their Parkinson's disease product is in collaboration with another company in the UK. And there's been some issues with getting material and getting approval and getting enough material to do these trials. So I am still holding on to the company and it's tough because I'm playing kind of a resolution of this Parkinson's disease product. As well, I think there is some upside from their rare disease programs, the GM1 and GM2 gangliosides, but it's definitely difficult. So I'm still holding on. They do have a lot of cash, but if they continue to push this out and are unable to restart their Parkinson's disease trial, or they don't present any Parkinson's disease updates because they do have patients that were treated before, and it would be nice to see an update on that, I think we're going to still see these lows on the company. So I'm still holding. It is definitely a difficult company to hold on to, but I do see them potentially having significant upside if they can resolve some of these issues. So I'm going to hold on, but it has been difficult, so I understand that. And with that, let's get to our main story for today, and that is talking about Curis Incorporated. Ticker symbol CRIS, and they traded on Monday, May 17th at 15 bucks a share, giving them a market cap of $1.4-ish billion. Their Q1 2021 net loss was $9.9 million, and they're sitting at Q1 2021 current assets of $162 million, with Q1 2021 current liabilities at $7 million. And what the company is doing is trying to develop novel cancer therapeutics. And they have two main programs. The first one is focusing on inhibiting a protein called IRAC4, and the other one is focused on antagonizing another protein called VISTA. Their IRAC4 inhibitor is called CA4948, and here they're looking for indications in acute myeloid leukemia as well as myelodysplastic syndrome. They're also looking at indications in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. CI8993 refers to the VISTA antagonist that they're clinically developing, and here they're looking at indications in solid tumors. And that's pretty broad, but I'm going to talk about that program in a little more detail later. So before I get into the data, I first wanted to talk about targeted cancer treatments in general, because they do act as kind of their own subsector, and there's a few reasons for this. But when I talk about a targeted cancer therapy, they're different from legacy treatments in that they're going to bind to a specific isoform or a specific protein in a pathway that's in a certain cell type. And this is different from a legacy cancer treatment because those will often target just proliferating cells broadly. And whether it's radiation or a chemotherapy, and here I mentioned a couple, chlorambucil or cyclophosphamide, and there's many, but these treatments preferentially target just proliferating cells. And as we know, high proliferation isn't just a feature of cancer cells, and it's an important feature of cancer cells, but there's a number of different cell types that also rapidly proliferate that would also be affected by chemotherapies or radiation. So what we wanna do with a targeted cancer therapy is potentially target a specific protein or a specific mutation that avoids the negative side effects associated with a classic chemotherapy or radiation treatment that will target normal cells and lead to higher side effects. So here, a targeted cancer therapy potentially has a better side effect profile and also potentially has greater efficacy because if the targeted therapy is good enough in that it preferentially binds to its target well enough, they'll be able to dose it at much higher levels than a treatment that could be more broadly applied because the on-target effects will only affect that single mutation or that single molecule. And I'm talking in broad terms because there's different molecules that could be referred to as a targeted therapy or not. But if we look, for example, Marathi's treatment for KRAS, this is a good example because their molecule will preferentially bind to a specific KRAS mutant. And what this means is that it'll avoid the normal RAS protein that is found in every single cell in our body. And what this means is that we can potentially dose Marathi's treatment at higher levels because it won't bind to those normal RAS proteins and only bind to the mutant KRAS. Now, we do see some side effects with Marathi's treatment, but they're much better than if it was just a general RAS inhibitor, which wouldn't be viable in the clinic because so many of our cells express RAS and need it to function properly. 
So in this way, you can think of a number of different genes that are mutated in different cancers that could be potential targets for biotech companies to generate compounds against. And if they're able to see success here, there's a lot of potential in different avenues. So that's the theory behind why targeted treatment could be so powerful in different types of cancers. Now, other things related to targeted cancer treatments is that these companies are highly sought after by large pharma for acquisition. Now, I list a couple here. Pharmacyclix was acquired by AbbVie, Arcule by Merck, and Loxo was acquired by Lilly. So, despite the fact that we haven't seen much M&A activity recently, oncology candidates are big uh, potential acquisition targets for large pharma. So, for that reason, it is, it, it is a reason why we should pay attention to them. Another benefit here is that oncology candidates generally have a lower bar of success from a clinical and a regulatory standpoint. Comparing the oncology space to the CNS space is very much night and day. The bar for CNS drugs is extremely high, whereas oncology companies can easily show single arm data that has a beneficial effect compared to you know, previous single arm data in other compounds. And if it's good enough, the FDA will approve it. So the bar is definitely lower for oncology companies. And for that reason, we should be focusing on them in general. Lastly, I wanted to mention that these drugs have a major market potential. Imbruvica and Venataclax are examples of drugs that target specific proteins, and they have seen significant revenue numbers from their respective companies. So it's for these reasons that targeted cancer treatments are very interesting, and we should be looking at them as a primary part of a biotech portfolio. Now, before I get into Curious, I wanted to talk about acute myeloid leukemia. And the reason for this is I focused before on non-Hodgkin lymphoma quite a bit, and AML is a big cancer indication that is uh, another hematologic malignancy, but it focuses on a different sector of the blood. So to put that in more detail, when we're talking about non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and I'm looking here at a the different blood cells that are found in the body, when we're talking about non-Hodgkin lymphoma, we're talking about cancers that arise from the lymphoid progenitor cells. Not directly, but cells that are associated with that side of the hematopoietic pathway. So T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, plasma cells, and small lymphocytes, these are cells that are involved to some extent in the non-Hodgkin lymphoma side of hematologic malignancies. When we're talking about acute myeloid leukemia though, we're talking about cells that derive from the myeloid progenitor pathway. So these are cells that are eventually gonna become basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, macrophages, uh, erythrocytes, and so forth. So what happens is that immature myeloid cells in the bone marrow get some kind of mutation. And it's unclear exactly why AML will happen in one patient or another patient, but enough mutations will happen such that there'll be an overgrowth of immature myeloid cells in the bone marrow this will spill into the regular blood compartment and eventually overtake the blood compartment, leading to a number of negative effects. The primary thing that happens is blood counts become abnormal. So patients end up with really low platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells, so they become susceptible to infection. And then what they also get is an increase in what they call blasts. So this primarily occurs in the bone marrow, but then it does end up happening in the regular blood compartments. So when we're looking for resolution, what we're hoping to see is that in the bone marrow, blasts reduce down to below 5%. And blasts can be upwards of above 50% sometimes, which can be very dangerous for patients. AML in general progresses quite rapidly and it can absolutely be fatal if it's not treated. So things to look for here are the baseline blasts and what happens after treatment occurs in terms of blasts. What we're also going to be talking about is whether or not the hematologic profile returns to normal, and specifically red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. We want those to all come back to normal in a treatment. In terms of the total addressable market, there are 20,000 cases per year of AML in the USA. These are projected numbers for 2021, and general leukemia sits at around 61,000 cases per year. Now to talk about the treatment of AML in general, uh, what is traditionally used is what's called a 7 plus 3 regimen, 
and this is of cytarabine and an anthracycline. And what they do is they do seven days of cytarabine and then three days of anthracycline, and there's a number of different anthracycline drugs that doctors could choose from, but they'll cycle through this, and what this is referred to is induction therapy. So this is the first uh, thing that an AML patient will see in order to remove the blasts from the blood and the bone marrow. And what happens here is that up to 70% of patients will achieve remission on this therapy. Not all patients will be suitable candidates from this type of regimen, what's called unfit AML patients, and in particular these are patients that are above a certain age. And so these elderly patients will seek a different kind of therapy so that it's not so hard on their body because this combination of chemotherapies can be pretty difficult for these patients. And I mentioned here that this is a target for Trillium. They're, they're targeting patients that are in this unfit AML category. Unfortunately, even though 70% of patients achieve a remission, there is a need for something called consolidation therapy because it's not enough for remission to occur. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's gonna be a cure because there might be a couple of cells that remain that have this mutation that allows them to repopulate the bone marrow and eventually the blood compartment of the body, and then there is a relapse. So there is a need in this market for treatments that can better remove all of those blasts, all of the minimal residual disease of the mutated blasts from the blood, so that patients can seek a cure and no longer need to worry about recurrences. So recurrences are pretty common in this and for that reason there is this need for better therapies. Now what's been discovered lately are these certain mutations that are currently included in what's called international risk stratification schema. And the th four different genes here, FLT3, NPM1, CBPA, and CKIT, these are genes that, if they're mutated, can lead to potentially greater risk of a recurrence. And the reason is complicated. There's a nut these proteins have different functions within the cell. But what's been discovered so far is that, especially in FLT3, if you treat patients with a 7 plus 3 regimen, as well as an FLT3 inhibitor, you tend to see a greater improvement in outcomes in patients. So there's a real opportunity here for biotech companies to develop targeted therapies that target these genes or other genes that are mutated in AML patients to potentially lead to better outcomes. And this is what Curis is doing. I'm putting here the percent of population of different disease driver genes, and IRAC4, the long version, is shown here at the top with apparently above a 50% incidence in the AML population here that has this mutation. It makes sense to reason that if we could inhibit IRAC4, we'd be able to help AML patients that have this mutation in particular. You'll notice here that FLT3 is found in about 25 to 30% of patients, and I'm also going to talk about inhibitors of IDH2 that are found in around 9 to 13% of patients. Now, given the 50% or greater potential patient population in AML, this works out to about a 10,000 AML patients per year total addressable market for Curis. In MDS, the incidence of MDS in general is 17,000 to 43,000 per year. So if we take half of that, it's around 8.5 thousand MDS patients per year as a total addressable market. Those two markets in general, I would say, are the primary market that Curis is going to seek to get approval in. They're also looking at non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but right now it's looking like it's just a basket of different non-Hodgkin lymphomas, so it's difficult for us to say exactly what a good total addressable market is for these patient populations. So I put here up to 75,000 NHL patients per year. This is very generous, and I don't think it's fair for us to include it into our model just yet because they're going to specify into something like DLBCL or something else. Now they also have a molecule that they're looking at indications in solid tumors. There are many, many patients in different solid tumors, so the upside is potentially infinite given that, and for that reason, I'm not gonna include that in the valuation here. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there might be potential for this molecule in non-IRAC4 mutated cancers. And I'm gonna touch on this a little bit later because the data that they showed seemed to implicate that there might be effect in 
cancers that are not primarily driven by a mutation in IRAC4. That's all I'll say for now, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. So if we add up these two, 10,000 patients for AML and 8.5 thousand patients for MDS, it's around 18.5 thousand patients per year that could be part of Curis's total addressable market. If we assume the cost of this drug is gonna be something in the neighborhood of $150,000 per year, if we assume they can get about half of those patients as like a potential peak, we're looking at around a $1.5 billion total revenue per year if everything goes well. And I think that's a reasonable jumping off point for valuation, assuming everything continues to go well for them in AML or MDS. Now, this is not including anything for non-Hodgkin lymphoma and not including anything for solid tumors. So right now, sitting at a $1.4 billion valuation, I'd say it seems reasonable to say that it's fairly-ish valued. But let's look at some competing molecules, and not direct competitors, but specifically, I want to look at FLT3 inhibitors and an IDH2 inhibitor. So FLT3 inhibitors, there's a few of them on the market now. One is called Midostorin or Rydapt, and it was approved by the FDA as a combination therapy with the 7 plus 3 regimen in 2017, specifically for FLT3 mutant AML patients. And it was approved based off of an overall survival readout in one of their big trials that they did. And the hazard ratio was 0.774 compared to placebo, which is very nice improvement. It's a Novartis drug that garnered a $300 million revenue in 2020. And it's projected to hit $1 billion eventually as like their peak revenue. So as of 2021 though, and it took around three years for them to get this, they were able to hit $300 million in revenue. Gilteritinib or Zospata is another FLT3 inhibitor. And it was approved by the FDA in 2018 for FLT3 mutant AML patients. The reason why it was approved was due to a trial versus a chemotherapeutic regimen. The complete response rate was 14.2% of patients with a duration of response that was very impactful, 14.8 months. And then the overall survival compared to chemo was a hazard ratio of 0.64, which is very nice as well. The drug is made by a company called Estellas Pharma, and they garnered a revenue of 217 million US dollars in 2020. So again, only a couple years on the market and they've seen $217 million of revenue. And this is for FLT3, which as I mentioned, potentially has 25 to 30% of AML patients. For another category of uh, targeted therapy, IDH2 is another potential driver of acute myeloid leukemia. And so a company developed something called anacitinib, and it specifically targets patients with an IDH2 mutation, and this is what they say is up to 19% of AML patients. It was approved by the FDA in 2017, and it was approved on only single arm data showing a 19% complete response with a median duration of 8.2 months in these patients. The company that owns the rights is Bristol Myers, and in their 2020 report, I was looking for the revenue numbers, but they were not shared there, so we don't really know how well it's doing just yet, but I assume once it does make a larger impact, we'll start to see those numbers. But so, the early numbers that we're looking at here in general is around 300 million per year. And if Curis can reach a larger patient population, we could see it garner a larger revenue number. So with that, let's talk about the efficacy of CA4948 and AML, and this is a trial in phase one and two, and I wanna first talk about the data they showed before the update in the last week, and the reason for this is I think what we really need to see are the changes in data from early to say now. So the data cutoff that I'm showing right here is from November of 2021, and this is a cohort of patients that are heavily pretreated. They've each received on average around three prior therapies, and we're looking at only six patients right now. It's an oral dosing regimen of 28 day cycles. And how the trial design is, is a three plus three escalation, starting at 200 milligrams twice a day, then going to 300, 400, and 500 milligrams twice a day. And so the data that they shared here are two bone marrow complete responders out of six, which is very nice, 33%. And what qualifies as a marrow complete response 
is that the patient's blast count must be elevated above 5% at baseline. And then to achieve that complete response, it has to decrease by 50% or greater to below 5% into that normal range in the bone marrow. So the two that received this marrow complete response originally had 11% and 23% respectively in the bone marrow as blast counts. And those dropped all the way down to 2% and 1% respectively. So the change is over 50%, the baseline was above five, and then they went to below 5%. If we see here on each individual patient, it looks like there's gonna be nice efficacy in every one of these patients. We have uh, some patients that have blasts in the 40% range here, some in the 20% range, and they do drop pretty substantially. One patient who had MDS had a blast baseline at 4%, and then it went down to 2%. So this is a pretty big impact on a percentage basis, but because it wasn't above 5%, they couldn't call it a complete response. So they're being fair here, and they're being pretty transparent with the data. So this is obviously encouraging to see. Now, what we saw in the update last week was abstracts and a press release that showed an update in data that they're going to present in the European Hematologic Association conference happening in early June of 2021. Now, this data update is a cutoff now from February of 2021. So it's adding about four months worth of data here. These are again in heavily pretreated patients, but they've increased the N from six to 15. And this includes eight MDS patients and seven AML patients. And what they tell us here is that bone marrow blast reductions were observed at all tested doses in eight of the nine evaluable patients. So there's 15 patients that have been dosed now, but only nine of them are evaluable. And of those evaluable patients, only one of them did not see a bone marrow blast reduction. So it's pretty nice data so far. Then what they go on to say is that the objective responses that were observed are one patient experiencing a full hematologic recovery complete response, one incomplete response with negative minimal residual disease, and then two bone marrow complete responders. Now, I am not a hematologist by training, and all of the research that I've been doing on this showed some mixed information on what these two other categories of complete responders are. Maybe somebody can tell me what I'm missing here, but what we really want are these bone marrow complete responders. What this is suggesting is that the bone marrow blast percentage is going down into that normal healthy range, and I believe that the hematologic profile is coming back to normal. Now what they say here is that one patient experiencing a full hematologic recovery complete response, to me that suggests that the hematology isn't quite yet in the normal range, but they're getting there. They're starting to show that the platelet numbers, the red blood cells are getting into that normal range, but they can't call it a complete response yet because it's not there. The incomplete response here is a similar thing in my opinion in that the hematology isn't completely back to normal, but they have seen negative minimal residual disease. So what that means to me is that they're not seeing any leukemic cells there, and the bone marrow is on its way back to getting to a normal percentage of blasts, but the hematology might not be totally there yet. Now, all of this is still very positive, so I don't wanna take anything away from the press release, but maybe my lack of understanding in hematology just doesn't make me quite get it but the two bone marrow CRs here are probably the ones from before that, we, that they showed here. And then they're also starting to see these other patients come in with an improvement in their bone marrow and their hematology. What they also mention here is that three patients that had a SF3B1 or a U2AF1 spliceosome mutation achieved a marrow CR or better. What this means is that they're sharing with us that Patients that had mutations that would lead to an IRAC4 long version, potentially driving the AML disease, are the ones that achieved the complete responses. This is validating to everybody that the drug that targets IRAC4 in particular is able to have an effect preferentially in patients that have the mutations that would lead to an IRAC4 long version. Now, it seems like other patients are also getting improvements in their percentage of blasts, irrespective of whether or not they have these spliceosome mutations. So to me, what this says is that there could be potential for CA4948 in patients that don't necessarily have 
a, an IRAC4 long version, but it could be an other subset of patients that could benefit from this drug. So it's a little bit curious here, and I think the expansion cohorts that the company is looking at, and I'm blowing it up here, is a response to this. So they're gonna be looking at four monotherapy cohorts. They're looking at MDS that are relapsed or refractory to a hypomethylating agent, those that have a spliceosome mutation, and those that don't have a spliceosome mutation. They're also going to look at relapsed or refractory AML patients that have an FLT3 mutation or those that are FLT3 wild type. So they also think that potentially it makes sense to uh, partition patients based off of their FLT3 status. And I'm not sure exactly what they're thinking here if they're relapsed or refractory to an FLT3 inhibitor potentially, that potentially the cells that are escaping the cure or the treatment are those that might be responsive to an IRAC4 inhibitor. So I'm just speculating here. I'm not sure exactly what they're thinking, but to me, it just seems like IRAC4 could be a target that could work in patients outside of those that have a spliceosome mutation. So in combination, they're going to be looking at two different cohorts. One is CA4948 with azacitidine, looking at AML or MDS in hypomethylating agent naive patients. They're also going to be looking at CA4948 with venetoclax in AML or MDS patients in venetoclax naive patients. So they're really expanding their reach with what they're hoping to see in different types of AML or MDS patients. And it's really exciting to see. I hope that the data that come from these are going to be able to shed some insight into who would be the best patient to receive CA4948. Because here what it's looking like is a lot of patients could benefit from it. They're seeing effects in eight out of nine of the patients, and that includes patients that don't have spliceosome mutations. So the other thing that they say is that all patients with objective responses also saw signs of hematologic recovery. So they're not at normal hematology just yet, but they're seeing that hematologic recovery to some capacity. So the presentation they're going to present, so this data was all from a press release as well as a abstract that was submitted to the European Hematologic Association, but we're going to see an actual oral presentation on Friday, June 11th at 3 a.m. Eastern Time. So some of the questions that I had here about what it means to be a patient experiencing full hematologic recovery, complete response, they're going to shed more insight into that for us to really know what they're talking about when they say this stuff. The bone marrow CRs, we got a pretty clear definition from the prior data, but I'm going to be curious to see what they mean by these other things, and also to see what these patients had at baseline. Like, I'm curious to see which patients had the 40% blasts in their bone marrow and whether or not they were able to get those patients all the way down to incomplete response or something like that. So I'm excited to see what they're going to show on June 11th. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the safety data because they didn't just present efficacy, they also shared some insights into safety. And a lot of people were negative on this and I'm gonna share why I don't think there are reasons to be concerned. And I'm quoting here, Curious updated that the 500 milligram twice a day dosing regimen in the AML MDS study has exceeded the maximally tolerated dose according to protocol guidelines. Two patients in the cohort were observed to have dose limiting toxicities one of whom had a grade 3 rhabdomyolysis, and the other experienced a grade 3 syncope. I think that's how you say that. Both adverse events resolved after discontinuation of dosing. Current enrollment is exploring lower dose levels to determine the appropriate recommended phase 2 dose. So what the company is saying here is that they've reached a maximally tolerated dose according to the 3 plus 3 trial design. And for those who aren't familiar with this 3 plus 3 trial design, I've outlined it here. I'm not going to read it all. I'll just explain that how it works is that they treat three patients in their lowest dose. If no patient has a dose-limiting toxicity, they move to the higher dose with three patients. If no patients have a dose-limiting toxicity there, they move to the next higher dose, and so forth. Now, if they get one dose-limiting toxicity, they'll treat another three patients at that same dose level. And if two or more dose-limiting toxicities occur in that expansion to another three patients, the prior dose will be known as the maximally tolerated dose, and the company should move ahead with that dose, we'll say. So what we're left with here is trying to question whether or not the patients that were responders are in that 500 milligram dose group, because 
if the 500 milligram dose group includes all the patients that had a response, you can obviously see how that's going to be a problem because they saw these serious grade three adverse events. So what we want is that 400 or below to be the dose where they did see some effects of their drug. And I don't think that these responders are in the 500 milligram dose. And the reason for that is in 15 patients that were evaluable, it looks like six of them are probably in that 500 milligram twice a day dosing regimen. The reason for this is we can count. Three patients were in the 200, three patients in the 300, three patients in the 400, that totals nine patients. Then they did six patients in the 500 milligram dose because they probably saw three patients and one of them had a dose limiting toxicity. They did another three and got another dose limiting toxicity. That's why they're saying that they're probably going to move ahead with the 400 milligram twice a day dosing. But the reason why I don't think the responders were necessarily in the 500 milligram dosing regimen is that they saw two marrow complete responses in only six patients, which, which probably only went up to the 300 milligram dosing regimen, is my assumption. The additional patients that they saw are probably either in the 400 or the 500 milligram dosing regimen potentially, but because of the way the patients are evaluable here, they're only evaluating nine patients, and I'm assuming that those are doses up to the 400 milligram dosing regimen because they haven't quite gotten yet to the 15 patient total here. They're only showing us data from nine patients. So it's for that reason why I'm pretty confident that of the nine patients, none of them are in that 500 milligram dosing regimen, but I'm just speculating here. And we're really, we're gonna see more of that data coming up in their June 11th presentation. So it's for these reasons that I don't think that this update in safety is anything to be worried about if they're gonna move ahead with a 300 or 400 milligram dosing regimen. So that's kind of a convoluted answer, I would say, to why I think that we don't have to worry too much about this safety. So I wanna quickly move on to the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma trials because they are looking at a basket of different non-Hodgkin lymphoma cancers. And so what they've done here in phase one is they've done two different dosing regimens at once a day or twice a day in the traditional three plus three design. They're looking at a variety of different doses in heavily pretreated patients who've used up to four median prior lines of therapy. So highly pretreated. And what they've shown here is that the potential recommended phase two dose of 300 milligrams twice a day, they saw effects in six out of seven of those patients. So the blue ones here are those that were on 300 milligrams twice a day. And one, two, three, four, five, six, we're able to see some positive response as opposed to a progression of the cancer. Now, these patients here that only saw a best response of maybe negative five, negative 10, they might be considered as stable disease or partial responders, so we don't quite know yet how they're gonna be officially categorized, but they're going to be updating this data in the second half of this year, and I think it's gonna be exciting to see whether or not they're able to improve this or maintain this in a follow-on. In terms of safety for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, most of those treatment-related adverse events occurred in the 400 milligram twice a day group. Now, they didn't really mention grade three or four TAEs in the AML study, and the patients are different, so it's potential that non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients are more susceptible to treatment-related adverse events. I'm not too sure, but um, it is something to note that in the 400 milligram group here, they are seeing more treatment-related adverse events. Now, having said that, with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they're thinking of moving with just the 300 milligram dose group. So anything that occurs in the 400 milligram group might not be anything we need to worry about. They do mention that rhabdomyolysis occurred in two patients in that 400 milligram dose group, and they did this based on muscle soreness and creatinine elevation. So what happens in rhabdomyolysis, it is a big danger for the kidney. And what they can look at is creatinine or CPK elevations in the urine. And if it gets too high, there is a risk of renal failure. So it could very well be a very serious side effect that the company has to worry about. But what they say here is that there was no renal dysfunction observed and both cases were observed in cycle one of dosing and then they had early monitoring of CPK. So they could see whether or not there was gonna be a problem long-term or not. They said that these patients had additional risk factors associated with vigorous exercise, dehydration, or co-medications such as lipid-lowering statins. So 
other factors could have been involved in leading to this rhabdomyolysis. I do think that it is something we should be mindful of once we see the full data set, but here, because it's in the 400 milligram dose cohort, I don't think it's something that we need to worry about too much. What might be more concerning are these two treatment discontinuations due to treatment emergent adverse events at the low doses. So this is something to watch out for. I think in the updated data in the second half of the year, if it becomes to be a trend that there are treatment discontinuations due to TEAEs, that could be a bigger problem than significant events that occur at the higher doses since they're not gonna be used. So like I mentioned, the company is moving ahead with reporting initial data in the second half of this year in an ongoing phase one, two, in combination of CA4948 plus ibrutinib in patients with relapsed or refractory non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We don't really know what they're gonna do with the monotherapy, so I do think it's interesting that they're shifting a little bit to a combination therapy with ibrutinib, which potentially could have a synergetic effect it remains to be seen, but I do think that this catalyst in the second half of this year could be a pretty big mover for the stock, depending on what we see. The last thing I want to talk about with regards to Curis is their molecule in solid tumors called CI8993. And this molecule was originally developed by Janssen. It was known as this Janssen molecule that was licensed from a company called Immunex in 2012. And they initiated a phase one study in 2016. 12 patients were enrolled and they started at a dose level of 0 0.005 milligrams per kg. What they discovered though is that low grade transient cytokine release syndrome was occurring at 0 0.15 mg per kg and above. What happened is that J&J halted the study after one dose limiting toxicity at subtherapeutic dose levels. The only patient treated at 0.3 mg per kg experienced a grade 3 CRS associated with encephalopathy after 36 hours of treatment. The patient was treated with antibiotics and symptoms resolved after this treatment with tocilizumab. What Kira says here is that the target range for expected anti-cancer activity is at doses of 0.5 to 2 mg per kg, and that J&J &J was never able to reach this before they just canceled the treatment. So I'm showing here some preclinical data suggesting that treatment with anti-Vista is able to improve a melanoma preclinical model. So what the company is doing is they got the rights to this molecule and they're moving ahead in a basket of solid tumors for a phase one study. They're targeting patients in advanced refractory solid tumors, including mesothelioma, melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and triple negative breast cancer. So all of these indications combined are a huge total addressable market, upwards of over 100,000 patients per year. And what Curis says is that their design of their phase one incorporates key learnings from the Janssen phase one study. They also say here that cytokine release syndrome is likely an on-target toxicity, indicating that the drug is hitting the target and inducing inflammatory responses, but that now that the oncology community is so used to dealing with cytokine release syndrome, they're now familiar with a treatment regimen that is able to manage it. And so they mentioned that the NCCN guidelines were issued in 2018, but when I looked at these, the guidelines said that the recommendations are treatment with tocilizumab and or corticosteroids. So it's not like J&J &J did something different than what would be normally recommended with these newly issued guidelines from 2018. What Curis says, though, is that the FDA cleared the IND study, which outlined their plan for managing CRS and enabled escalation to therapeutic dose levels. And then I'm just going to blow this up here. What they say is their plan for dose escalation. So I think there's definitely potential here, but it's one of those things where it's gonna be a high risk trial where the likelihood of success is very low. The fact that J&J &J saw a lot of CRS in the sub-therapeutic dose levels suggests to me that they're gonna see a similar thing when Curis does a phase one trial. Now, one opportunity that I see here though is that J&J &J halted the study only after one patient was dosed. And this could have been a fluke, only one patient getting a grade three CRS, while it's not a good thing, obviously, it does leave opportunity to suggest that if they had dosed more patients, it might just be a minority of patients that see this grade three CRS. And if it's a grade one CRS in most patients, maybe it can be manageable by this new regimen. Now this is the unlikely scenario. I think that if one patient saw grade three CRS, the likelihood is that more patients are gonna see it and it's gonna be a lot higher burden than what maybe Curious is letting on here. But 
I took a look at some CAR T therapies that were approved specifically because I knew that grade 3 CRS was a problem for them. And Yaskarda and KTE X19 in different non Hodgkin lymphomas had around 13% of grade 3 CRS. So if Curis can show that their treatment of patients of CI8993 can be effective and also have a limited amount of CRS down to around 13%, there could be a path to approval here. So it really is going to take seeing the data. And right now we'd just be speculating, but it's going to be one of those things that if they are seeing good data, the stock will move hugely on the news, but more likely than not, they're going to see safety issues that preclude them from moving forward. So to talk about some upcoming catalysts, the main one obviously is this oral presentation at the European Hematology Association conference. This is going to happen on June 11th at 3 a.m. Eastern Time. It's obviously a European conference, so it's going to be presenting at kind of an inconvenient time for those of us in the USA. The company is also going to do a Q&A session on June 16th, and that's going to be happening at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The company also has a poster presentation, but this is just preclinical data, so I don't see this being a big mover for the stock. Another catalyst is going to be coming in the second half of this year of their phase 1 and 2 combination study of CA4948 plus a brute nib in patients with relapsed or refractory non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And then in the second half of this year, they're going to be sharing data from that CI8993 study in the treatment of relapsed or refractory solid tumors. So overall, my take, though, is that CA4948, it's going to be a first-in-class, potentially, IRAC4 inhibitor, and it seems to have a significant improvement in hematologic malignancies. Now, being a first-in-class molecule has tremendous advantages. Obviously, this company is probably starting to get the attention of a lot of larger pharma companies that might be looking to break into a molecule that could be first-in-class in AML. TG Therapeutics has a competing molecule, but they're still in preclinical development, so we need to see clarity on that timeline before we can think about seeing TGTX as being a competitor to them just yet. I think that in terms of catalysts, the added data in June is not likely to surprise us, but like I mentioned before with how they presented the press release, they're going to give us more granularity on the baseline of these patients, as well as what dose they were treated with, and all of this stuff is going to be very helpful. I think in helping us analyze whether or not we can be really excited about the data. I do think the data is super positive, but more granularity here I think is going to be well received. The combination data release in non-Hodgkin lymphoma in the second half of this year I think is going to be a big catalyst for the company. I would see a potential upside of only around $2 billion and downside of around $700 million on the catalyst if it didn't go their way. So, you know, is it worth it to play this? It's kind of up to you to decide. If the company is able to garner a buyout, I would say that it's fair to say they could potentially do 5 to $10 billion buyout, but that's like a long shot. I don't think we should be planning our trades based off of potential M&A activity, which lately there hasn't been much of. So I think that we can get excited about it being first in class, getting a lot of attention from big pharma, but we need to temper those expectations because... We just don't know if it's on the table or not. The solid tumor data could potentially see a huge upside if they are able to see an effect, but like I mentioned, I think that there's a lower chance of success. But depending on what the company is trading at in the second half of this year, if you want to throw a few shares on it and see whether or not they are able to get that positive data, it could be worth it for you. The upside is going to be way greater than the downside, I think, for that. So I might look into playing that catalyst or maybe the non-Hodgkin lymphoma catalyst, but... For me, I'm going to kind of sit on the sidelines. I watch the company go through this run-up in the stock, and where it's sitting now, I don't see a ton of upside necessarily, unless the update in June is particularly amazing, but I think we've seen most of the details there. If the company does see some selling off, I might take a position in the second half in hopes of a positive readout in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, or maybe the solid tumor indication, which could be a pretty big mover too. The two comparisons that I think are valid for this company is one which I've touched on before, which is the company 47. Magrolimab was a pretty much first mover in the CD47 space to show efficacy in AML as well, and they were bought out by Gilead for $4.9 billion. Then Venetoclax, and that's the trade name here, which is Venclexta, was a first-in-class BCL2 inhibitor, and now they have 
indications in CLL, SLL, as well as unfit AML. So it's not quite a valid comparison to Curis, but their revenue in 2020 was $1.3 billion. So there's definitely a huge market that is available here, depending on what they can end up showing. So, so all this to say that I, I think the company has a lot of potential and it's really gonna take us reaching those added milestones to see whether or not they can deliver. But it's very exciting for patients that have AML and are unable to get a response with the legacy treatments that exist today. So that's curious. Let me know what you think in the comments. Am I off base? Tell me what I'm missing about the complete responders. In terms of upcoming catalysts, I already touched on Anobis and SIO gene therapies. We're still waiting for Atrika data, but we did hear from their year end or the Q1 wrap up that there were no dose limiting toxicities observed yet. I see that as a very positive outlook, even though the stock has sold off quite a bit in the last little while. Hepion, we're still waiting for data in Q2. Oncturnal, no updates yet, but they're going to present something at ASCO. ALX Oncology, we're still waiting for mid-2021 updates. And then for D-molecular therapies, the lockup is expiring in June, early June. So I would not hold the company into that. The number of shares that are going to be thrown into the market are going to be substantial. So definitely watch out for that. In terms of a portfolio wrap-up, the last couple of weeks have been rough. I'm not going to lie. I'm sitting at around negative 17% on the year. Quite nicely with ArcG, to be honest, and I don't even hold names like Beam or CRISPR, so very frustrating, but it is what it is. We expect these kind of big swings in the XBI. The IBB and XBI are also downturning quite a bit, and I think it's really going to take some big changes in rhetoric from the government or some surprise news in M&A or something like that before we can really see a turnaround here. So we'll see. I'm still holding on to names that I do have conviction in, but... Like I've mentioned before, I'm very heavily invested, so I think in the next month or two, I'm going to look to reduce all my positions so I can have some cash on hand. So that's that. I did want to mention that I added more Anobis here, so I have 50 shares now, and I'm going to be looking to exit after the Alzheimer's disease data readout. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. appreciate all the support. Click that like button and share this with a friend if you think that they might appreciate this kind of content. So with that, thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.